thanks thanks a lot udbhav and thanks uh, everyone for joining uh, joining us today um and, and uh, thanks to in particular to udbhav and zena who helped me uh, sort of shape this uh, presentation because as as y'all might have noticed it's slightly different from the other presentations that you've uh, you have heard previously in npd week and the excellent presentations that will follow as and it is not uh, going to go into the weeds of the report or uh, the, the implications from uh, a, a domestic regulatory or legal perspective neither is it going to be a session where i unpack what the different approaches to regulating npd are because both of these things will be covered in or either have been covered or will continue to be covered throughout this week so what i'm going to try and do and i think this is important to do whenever we appreciate any uh, regulatory policy or try and evaluate any regulatory policy is just take a step back and evaluate the broader context and this includes both the domestic political context but also because of interdependence the geopolitical context within which this report came about and therefore what are the ways in which india with its own sets of strategic interests and priorities how can it use the report to a benefit and ubhav already sort of gave a broad overview of the research question of the stock which is how can it india use this report to uh, benefit prioritize its strategic interests which is of course protecting and promoting uh, fundamental rights and citizen liberty but also of course ensuring that there is fair and free innovation and competition uh, sometimes it's it's perhaps easier to not mix these two agendas up but i'll try and explain how in terms of shaping rules this in in principle this instrument or this regulatory initiative is something that could play a role given the complex political landscape we are in today although there are various reasons for which in its present form version 2 doesn't really uh, fit the bill um in some senses so in principle it's it's a great thing and therefore i want to explore it from a foreign policy perspective but um we have to really look at what the uh, report is trying to do and and how it fits into this to this ecosystem right so um the next uh 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 sorry um there's uh, i'm having some difficulty with uh, my slide share um let me try again um uh it appears to not be uh moving okay uh got it sorry about that yeah so um as i said the scope of the talk is is already done um and uh what i uh, wanted to before we go into the substance of the talk is why geopolitics and foreign policy is relevant to an area that has traditionally been about economic regulation and uh, economic uh, regulation technical feasibility uh, the legal aspects that have been covered in the report foreign policy hasn't actually explicitly been mentioned in the report as a consideration but of course the buzzword of sovereignty has been uh, put up in in the beginning so to do that we need to appreciate where the regulatory context within which this report came about this followed a series of reports so we had the in 2018 august of 2018 we had the shri krishna committee's report that set up the personal data protection bill if you recall the slogan or the title of that report it was constructing a free and fair digital economy for india right so it was that was the title there was a the e-commerce uh, policy the draft e-commerce policy which uh, again had the slogan india's data for india's development and within these trends we had even outside of the policy making world there were several media releases where actors from all across the spectrum whether it is industry doens like mukesh ambani or a set of civil society actors who wanted to reclaim this notion of uh, of sovereignty from what was being called digital colonialism right so it, there was a slew of policies seeking to assert greater regulatory control to essentially take back what is supposedly rightfully india's digital uh, economy from the evil extractive practices of large technology companies and all the all of this is i mean sounds great and this was the political context in which in which this emerged and this is not the i mentioned three policies there are so many others there is the nod the node policy that came about earlier last year there was that the depa the data empowerment and protection architecture and and so many more and non personal data is also of course considered in the present version that we know of the personal data protection bill so it was this ecosystem that sought to make a statement globally that india is not going to continue to be the victim of data colonialism and essentially assert a greater 
uh, sovereignty over the way its digital economy is governed and that is the context in which the, the version 1 of the report and version 2 of the report came about and it's important for us not to forget uh, this political context because there was in incessant um lobbying both formal and informal formal being where uh, stakeholders go and directly speak to the government informal where there are media statements that uh, again try to sell this this narrative of india needing to reclaim its economy from uh, from extractive foreign companies um back to the age of colonialism so to speak so this is the narrative around the report and it's important to keep that in mind right so um the next uh, uh just quickly i want to run through this and this is the parameters through which i am actually evaluating this question this foreign policy question is what do we mean by digital sovereignty everyone here would have definitely heard heard this phrase um and it's it's very complex it's used in multiple different contexts from when we and chinese gets to uh, and report to when we uh Uh, assert greater regulatory scrutiny over the transfer of data sovereignty is the buzzword but very simply it is for me based on understanding of traditional sovereignty it is three things uh, so one is obviously regulatory assertiveness which is the ability to impose domestic regulations and shape global rules it is um strategic uh independence from global uh like from uh, global uh, technology companies and from from nation states now independence is uh, an interesting term right because very often even if you want to be independent global realities and the way in which your strategic interests are structured require you to work with others we live in an age of interdependence where no matter how independent you want to be there will have to be a little give and take and a little bit of alliance building that goes on so independence with that caveat and because of india's constitutional ethos and the way in which our society is designed to be governed one and two should not be imposed in a manner that benefits a set of industry stakeholders but it should benefit largely individuals and champion fundamental rights while prioritizing innovation and competitiveness competitiveness so that indian citizens benefit so indian citizens are very much at the core of any uh, regulatory scheme and they should be at the core of india's digital sovereignty uh, approach as as well right so that's that now a little bit of very quick ir theory i'm going to try and spend as less time on this as possible just to set the stage for the global landscape basically finmore and sicking who are two i mean they are like the i, I, I don't know like uh, uh, the the some of the rock ro they were two rock stars of the ir community back in the 1990s uh, so um they basically came up with this theory of understanding how norms evolve evolve in the global uh, domain and i'm going to try and explain this and make it not too boring by not using a tech example but by using an example that we are all familiar with which is war um so generally now if i ask you do you think war is a good thing or do you think nations should resolve resort to war because they feel like it your answer would be obviously not you're asking me a crazy question right but interestingly enough till about 90 till about 100 years back in the 1920s that was how global politics was structured war was actually okay as long as you were writing a wrong i mean before 1600 you could go to war for anything in the 17th century it shifted to where you could only go to war if you were writing a wrong but there were no restrictions and then only after world war 2 did a norm emerge where a certain set of actors basically uh, again there is a commercial interest there a set of banking lawyers who felt that their economic interests were getting harmed by uh, by world war 1 who decided that this is not a normal state of being and then there was uh, uh, they took it to um, global fora there was the basically where the ex would say that there is a little bit of disruption of this cycle which is the fourth phase that's not in this diagram where you actually have a new kind of war coming in right where without actually raising military weapons you could under undertake cross border cyber attacks that may or may not come in within the traditional understanding of war and that is what is is leading to um a recon a necessary reconfiguration of where we are at uh, today so this is the norm cycle explained to the lens of war 
same norm cycle um let's uh, talk about the data governance uh, landscape that is led us to where we are today right so historically since the digital economy came about it was a very clear uh, status quo right where essentially there was a tussle between the us like hands off approach that said that there should be free flow of data across borders little to no regulatory intervention and companies no matter how big they got should drive the market the largely till about 5 years back the eu also opted into this approach they believe that the best way for the digital economy to proliferate is for governments to exercise as few regulatory hurdles as possible a number of countries emerging economies including india actually resisted this this uh, approach and didn't actually agree with it at international fora but because of the muscle the sheer financial muscle and regulatory clout that the us had throughout the 1990s 2000s there were very few countries that actually chose to oppose status quo with china sort of being a bit of an bit of an exception right because they did assert far stronger regulatory controls this all changed around 20 sort of maybe 5 years back towards the end middle of the next decade where there was a tipping point largely because there was a split in how the us and the eu saw this debate the eu because of civil society pressure actually wanted to exercise greater regulatory scrutiny on on big technology companies there was the famous 2016 judgment of the european court of justice the, the schrems case that had a uh, reprieve uh, recently as well which said that uh, the us does not protect is in uh, privacy enough and um, so you had this bit of a tipping point and then there is a new norm you could say that's emerging because the old norm is getting disrupted where uh, emerging economies eu are all looking to exercise greater regulatory scrutiny example of that obviously is the non personal data report on the policies that i mentioned but if you look at uh, in the annex of the report there are various other examples given right there is japan is looking to ex exercise greater scrutiny um the netherlands is looking to exercise greater scrutiny of course the eu is in itself taking on or all all of europe approach to data sovereignty so really it is we are in a phase where we are moving from norm emergence to norm cascade where the exact contours of this regulatory scrutiny the exact contours of how data must be shared is actually um being debated at the at the global re global realm and therefore we are now really at a, at a, at a, at a tipping point which has emerged because of the split between uh, us and the eu and also i suppose the the recognition among regulators in the west um that uh, you know unregulated big tech can cause harm to citizens and uh, india has recognized that as well so therefore this is the uh, very long uh, setup to the context we are in uh today right again we as quickly this is possible so the wto again there was a split like i mentioned um where in 1998 there was uh some agreement among again the developed world that there needed to be regulation on e-commerce and they started what was a work program on thinking of how restrictions on e-commerce so basically they wanted to eliminate any domestic regulation of e-commerce that would harm the global global free flow, free flow of services and uh, there was basically the similar kind of blocks where india was us to their ability to regulate e-commerce that was the setting up of of the of the work program therefore was a bit of a compromise because what the developing world which india was of course uh, 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 uh you could say a flag bearer and leader of got the fact that any discussion on e-commerce would happen at the general council of the wto now why is this body important it's because it operates on consensus not on majority voting but on consensus so it means that if any measure needs to get passed which restricts the ability of a country to regulate then you need to get all the members of wto on board so while there were no clear rules on e-commerce the uh, the developing countries got their bit where they said that any future negotiations have to happen at the general council and till everyone agrees there will be no rules no trade obligations as such what the developed world got on the other hand was 
a moratorium on customs duty. So customs duty is one kind of uh, regulatory restriction that may come about. And they said that there will be uh, no customs duties at all. And India and South Africa repeatedly, uh, they have been a major player, the WTO, you all would have seen in the news that um, with respect to the COVID vaccine waiver also, they've been uh, sort of up, up in arms about some of the actions of the other countries. And they said that this continued imposition of no customs duties is harming our economy. So there has been this long-standing debate at the WTO. In 2017, it sort of split up where uh, the developed world said we can't handle this consensus system where uh, we are getting blocked all the time. So therefore, they basically sa said that uh, we won't, uh, uh, we will create a separate parallel uh, track outside of the general council. So there's no need for a consensus. It's called the joint statement initiative. And that led to the famous 2019 uh, Osaka track, which I'm, which has been in the news for a, for some time at the G20 meeting uh, in, in June of 2019, where certain countries said that we will commit to creating rules on data governance and India notably opposed that. So throughout this process, India has been opposing the limitation of its right to regulate. And why? Because it wants to have regulatory space to come up with the non-personal data report. The question really is, are we um, actually shaping it in a manner that is benefiting us, right? So again, if you object to things, which I think has been a fair thing to do in line with India's strategic interests, um, the question is, can you then utilize whatever regulation you have to shape it in a manner that benefits the criteria of sovereignty I spoke about earlier? Interestingly enough, there has been some discussion on whether the NPD report violates any uh, international trade law, so to speak, that exists. It actually does not, because the two major obligations in trade law, very simply put, is basically that you shouldn't discriminate against uh, companies from uh, outside, so your the companies within India and the companies outside of India should be subjected to the same uh, regulations, which the report does. And you shouldn't, there shouldn't be, uh, I mean, uh, the most, there shouldn't be uh, sort of SOPs given or preferences given to one country over the other, unless overall the trading uh, uh, regime is benefiting. So really, it's not really violating any international obligations that India has. Further, there are actually no rules on data. So you could argue that, okay, even if there are no rules on data, there are traditional obligations India is violating through this NPD report. That I can strongly say that there isn't actually any obligation they're violating, but there are obviously uh, concerns, right? So I'll, I'll go through this relatively quickly. So when we evaluate the NPD report for its po po the possible role it can play in foreign policy, the one thing that sticks out is the sovereign purpose rule for uh, sharing data. The problem with it is not so much what additional obligations the sovereign purpose rule brings about for uh, companies or how it harms individual privacy more. Uh, technically, the committee has said that we will not do anything because there are already rules that regulate that. But what we have is actually one of the most draconian surveillance regimes in the world. And it is, in terms of how well uh, the privacy of one's own citizens are protected, it's actually worse than the US, which has got its uh, fair set of flack. So by mentioning the sovereign purpose, devoting a paragraph to it, and then saying that we will not comment on it because obligations already exist, what's happening essentially is norm entrenchment, right? Where you are normalizing something that should be recognized as hugely problematic. So this use of sovereign purpose, and we should recognize the kinds of problems that the surveillance regime has brought about from a foreign policy perspective. It has prevented us from uh, getting several uh, agreements into place, executive arrangements under um, various, the, the Cloud Act, one could argue that the surveillance regime is one of the reasons for it. Uh, it is definitely violating the standards that the GDPR and, and the, the European Convention on Human Rights has laid down. So it is, it is a problem because if you want to have access to data and you want to be perceived as a responsible data governance power, you cannot continue to assume that this access to uh, data for sovereign purpose is, is, uh, is more than enough, right? So um, uh, yeah. So Udbhav has told, told me that I have three, four minutes more, which is perfect. So the two quick uh, uh, compliance uh, compliance issues. Um, one is uh, cross, cross border flows. And again, there's something that hasn't been, uh, been spoken about enough. Um, let's understand what the data sharing mandate is, right? It basically says that 
any non-personal data uh, with, of course, I mean, there are the public good and the high value data set, but basically it is data set that may not necessarily be stored in India because as per now, the regulatory scheme of the personal data protection bill is only applies to sensitive personal data and anything that the government notifies as critical data. So it's very possible that the kind of data sharing regime that this report calls for will actually have data stored in other countries. So you'll actually have to comply with the laws of the other country, which may or may not have the same uh, data sharing mandates that we have, right? So because we are in a very early stage, it's important to ensure that we harmonize so that we don't aren't in a position where there is a conflict of laws where, where a company that's supposed to comply with something under this regulation whenever it does become a regulation uh, while also trying to compete with the regulators of another country right? i think the cross-border data flows is an issue that needs to be looked at um, and because all of the data may not necessarily be stored in india the second and this was actually something Ubhav was discussing with me is that very often data from uh, that a company inferred data that a company gets is often like, like a supply chain is often inferred from uh, citizens of various parts of the world, right? So when it is de-anonymized, unless you actually have harmonious, uh, so, uh, uh, har harmon sorry, when it is anonymized, when unless you have a harmonious regulatory regime, you actually have a problem where India has one data sharing regime. So you have to ensure that you comply with whatever public good and all the regulatory questions here. But you have um, the EU and the US having very different regimes, right? So while there is a norm cascade, there is an important to work with allies to actually ensure uh, a coalition. Um, this And therefore recognize the interdependence that countries have on one another. The final point, I'll actually go into my final slide, is that uh, point four here is that because we are so far early into this stage, right? No other country except for the EU has even thought about regulating data in, uh, or regulating data sharing specifically in this way. They've thought of regulating data. It's going to be a process that takes uh, a fair amount of time. So is it, my fourth point here, is it now should we already be setting up mandates, whether it is you know, the, the version two has a far less onerous mandate than version one, but is it already time to be setting up mandates? Three very quick suggestions on how the, the government should play this. Um, one is work across institutions. Historically, if you look at any successful regime that India has shaped, climate change, tobacco control, nuclear weapons, test ban, it has always been because institutions are aligned and institutions work with one another to get the best expertise capacity out. Also, the best regimes come when there is consultation with civil society. So. Uh, these kind of events, uh, the kind of event that Hasgeek has organized is, is very, very important. Um, as I said, the, clarify sovereign purpose that that makes, uh, I mean, very little sense. If, you, if you're not a big fan of uh, civil liberties, that's fine, but it doesn't make sense from a pure foreign policy perspective either. And be very clear about the advantages of shaping the rule, because in some senses, India, you could argue, is a norm shaper and India is driving norm emergence. But there are clear costs of being excluded where if the regime is not harmonized with um, or other countries don't come on board, then there is always a possibility of uh, costs, economic or otherwise, that India may impose. And that is a challenge in terms of its of its foreign policy. None of this thinking, at least explicitly, is in the reports. This is all stuff that sort of I am drawing from it. But I do hope that the government and the writers of the report consider these uh, questions because it does offer an opportunity, but if not uh, done properly, uh, offers a number of costs as well. With that, sorry for exceeding time. I'll yield back to her. Thank you. Thank you so much, Arindaji. That was, a, I think, a very fantastic overview of like the framework in which um, international diplomacy is grappling with the idea of, of data governance in a manner that maintains uh, interoperability. I think in particular, it was very, very interesting to see how the various sort of mandates that this report has taken upon itself, one, while it's never explicitly mentioned, like you said, uh, is, is of sort of trying to create India's position in the international arena for how it should govern uh, and answer many of these questions of, of data. But um, we have seen like both since um, July, August of last year, as well as uh, when the second version of the report came out later in December, there have been many members of the committee of experts that have drafted this report that have again and again said that this is India's attempt to 
frame a conversation globally for the first time and um, is uh, and very clearly pointed towards its that sort of diplomatic angle that this report is expected to play to sort of not just build internal consensus in india but also to galvanize other countries um, around the world towards this topic um, and i think i'm going to use like some of that setting context because uh, in in the conversation that we were having earlier today about this uh, session uh, tarunama had brought up the fact that this report seems to be a, like a one ring or a slash bill to rule them all and, and covers so many vast areas in one go that it may not necessarily end up doing a good job of all of them at the same time. So Tarnava, I would like sort of welcome you to come in, provide your thoughts both to what Basu has said as well as otherwise uh, on this area. Great. Uh, thanks, Udhav. And also thanks, Arindriji. That was a fantastic uh, overview. I learned a lot uh, from that historical trajectory as well. Uh, so I, I think, um, you, you know, one thing, you mentioned digital sovereignty. And I think one thing I, I always think is that data sovereignty is not the goal, right? Like it is um, a means to the end of digital sovereignty. And when you think of the, the value chain, there are so many different aspects um, of, let's say, a data business, right? And um, even if, let's say, some uh, a certain country, specifically if we're thinking of the countries that participated in the Osaka track, if they are emphasizing on data, that's that's because that is where the bottleneck for them is in terms of um, sort of economic growth within the data industry, right? But that's not necessarily where India's bottleneck is, right? In terms of uh, in terms of the industry, and so uh, when we're thinking about sort of we're emphasizing so much on data without really considering all the other aspects of the industry that required us to be uh, in some ways independent or self-reliant, right? And the question is, can we be self-reliant in those in those areas? And if we can't, and this is what Arindrajit, what you were saying, is that uh, that interdis there is like strategic independence because there is interdependence, right? And so when we when we look at data exclusively, right, we should also understand that eventually there is there are going to be implications and negotiations on other aspects of the of uh, the industry when uh, what we are arguing for in terms of uh, data does not match what they actually expect, right? So, so our dependence on hardware, we are dependent on uh, America, we're dependent on East Asian countries for a lot of the hardware, for a lot of hardware needs, right? And so uh, I do think that it's, it's um, that's also somewhat like the challenge of looking at specifically data, which is also in some ways the most tricky aspect to intervene because that's where digital, so like your, your sort of national sovereignty actually uh, can contradict bodily sovereignty, right? And so, in some ways, we're picking like the the hardest uh, avenue to intervene, and um, asserting that as the only means of digital sovereignty. So I do think that I mean, again, uh, you you've mentioned all the different ways in which um, you know we are we are like proposing and we want to be the norm setter. And I do think that uh, any proposal has to be um, implementable, right? Like it has to be something that that is feasible, right? And for it to be, and I think it's it's good for us to actually uh, state our interests, but I think it also has to be, um, it has to be feasible for, for it to be considered fairly seriously, right? And so if, um, so, sort of looping back to the question of like the different interdependencies, if today we are very particular about data sovereignty and um, one of the things that, you know, uh, Arindrajit, you were mentioning that how does that even work when, a lot of these data sets are hosted outside the country. So if that is the case, uh, I, I guess one of the responses would be to let's say do, you know, uh, <laughs> do like data storage, do sort of do a NPD with like localization, which is again, another like uh, sort of consistent refrain in, in the policy discourse for the last two, three years. Um, but what does it mean in terms of like local industry development when um, an AWS only provides certain kind of services you know, in the US, but does not provide certain processing ca capabilities in India, right? Um, and so again, I, the, the point being that there is all these, this, um, you know, there are all these other various factors that are needed for that, for the, for the growth of the industry. And we're actually going to possibly um, focusing specifically on data and sovereignty there. Um, yeah, like impede or sort of uh, strike a goal against our broader, broader vision. Uh, so I'm going to pause at that. Um, I'm not actually, I wasn't sure how long I was supposed to speak, but I'm going to pause at that. Yeah.
So thanks, sir. Manu, we can always come. Like, if there are other points you want to cover, we can always like come back to them. Uh, uh, Shashant, I mean, like from your uh, like sort of vantage point within Umedia, where you you have an ability to see not only at a lot of the sort of work that civil society is doing in India, but also on the industry side in terms of investment, startups, and uh, like those perspectives um, from a global interoperability perspective, and and the vision that an Indian startup or a player may have to be a global player in a particular field, and their perception of this entire sort of non-personal data reports saga but even independently more broadly how india is considering data governance is uh, i'm sure something that you have thoughts and opinions about so over to you uh, for maybe the next uh, three to four minutes maybe up to five thanks Udba. and uh, arunduji thank you for that fantastic uh, overview and thank you tarunima for your thoughts um before we began i was telling arunduji how this uh, particular perspective or approach is quite unique from what i'm regularly used to which is more an in-depth uh, uh, detailed dissection of the entire uh, report versus looking at you know the uh, more the sovereignty and the uh, international uh, norm setting uh, perspective of uh, of the data governance discussion so quite fascinating and i'm, I'm happy to be here thank you to hasgeek for inviting me um, so i just wanted to begin with a small um, sort of event that i was part of in fact organized which was around uh, and this is hard to communicate, but around rethinking the data paradigm as to reimagining our relationship with data. And few things that struck out uh, for me, and this was a global conversation, including US, EU, and of course, some, uh, some of our uh, uh, members of the committee uh, as well uh, from India. And some things that uh, stood out was in terms of, and we are trying to use the framework that, or I'm trying to use the framework that Aurindrajit uh, spoke about, which is norms, emergence, cascade, and then internalization. So I think we are in the phase of norms emergence where India is playing a role and is kind of walking uh, shoulder to shoulder with the global discourse. And there are reasons for that. I think some of the norms that we, saw getting shaped uh, one was on you know this distinction about you know data is an ip and property and copyright of the collector down to almost like an internalization internalization of thinking about the rights and civil liberties of associated with personal data the second is uh, data was data was uh, is uh, at least known to be intricately linked to an individual and therefore is is known as individuals data or data about an individual from there there is an increasing uh, recognition that there is a relational nature to data uh, data about me can tell you about uh, orindrajit as to where he was uh, where he was in the evening on this 25th jan and therefore these norms are also getting shaped. It's not just the individual. The third is around uh, looking from private profits only in terms of the, how data is being utilized, how data is being uh, seen in the value chain of businesses to thinking about public interest, public purpose. Again, from uh, for going from the data as property down to thinking about uh, uh, data as, uh, you know, the relational nature of data, data as, uh, something that has a community value associated with. And lastly, which is more around how things are getting shaped, more and more the conversation is shaped from open data bringing value to uh, a nuanced conversation about how can you responsibly steward data to unlock the value that is coming out of it. So all of this, these norms in the context of these norms being uh, shaped as we speak, uh, I think India and this discourse, and I'm, I'm uh, wearing the hat of an optimist, as I told Sarujima earlier, uh, India is uh, is playing the role, or at least uh, uh, walking step uh, step in step with the global discourse, as far as these norms are uh, uh, concerned. And this has taken quite some time for us to get here, get to this stage in terms of how the conversation has evolved. I think you should take a look at the e-commerce re draft report that had come out and look at the non-personal data report that has come out. And if you do a comparative analysis, the maturity of the discourse is far more advanced. And majority of the conversation that we are having, let's not say much, call it maturity, but at least the nuance of uh, the conversation that we are having in terms of data is far more advanced. And uh, uh, of course, India is playing a role in that. 
taking an example of data governance the ontario waterfront front project in canada which was the whole side la sidewalk labs discussion around how google is taking up uh, as a private data trust and will control data and things like that there's a large conversation large scholarship that is associated with what data trusts are what are intermediaries supposed to do how will governance uh, come out of it but i think of a, another externality that was far more important which was around the scholarship that emerged out of that practice uh, the the scholarship that has come out from canada on data intermediaries on data trust on data stewardship is very rich and it's very context dependent is very much rooted in the laws and regulations that have come out from canada and that i think is a contribution that this report can also make in whatever limitations that it may have is is sparked through its statement of intent it has sparked this conversation around the norms and is helping shape the emergence of these norms and to that end if i look at european union talking about data altruism which is sort of uh, very similar to if you do a comparative assess assessment very similar to the intent that the non personal data has uh, 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 data report has come up with and of course the arc is towards being less coercive being making it less mandatory which is all very welcome uh, but us is playing catch up and again in one of the conversations that we were part of while it's generally accepted that mobility data will bring a lot of value to the community uh, say in india or in in europe or in the uk and this is part of call, uh, scholarship as well it it comes as a, a sort of a nuanced new perspective in terms of thinking about value or community's value in the us and therefore i would say in norm setting in practice us is playing catch up and there is a role for countries like india of course eu and now uh, uk outside of eu to play uh, in in how these things uh, shape up um i think one of the elements that i want to put a spotlight on is on data trust the way the report and this is where i'm going a bit specific the report calls out data trustees in a very broad definition which takes into account either a public trust or a private trust or a non profit and what not and therefore gives a very uh, gives 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 a uh, uh, gives a broad spectrum on which a data trust can operate i think this is where uh, digressing from the global conversation needs a bit more detail around you know why we are uh, saying what we are saying in terms of what the roles and responsibilities of the data trustees are um, and also root it in the regulatory and the legislative framework i think vidhi center for legal policy did fantastic work in finding out in which uh what are the gaps in terms of our legislative framework in which data trust can and cannot operate and you know what how can we fill that gap in terms of the principles so we should take uh, inputs from that and one specific suggestion and this will be my last point with bob one specific suggestion on uh, uh, to the committee in terms of shaping these norms and shaping it in a more credible manner uh my read of the opportunity is that the conversation is uh, conceptual and theoretical at this stage um, and and i i, I would not uh, I, i'm not surprised that it is conceptual and theoretical but that's where the opportunity lies uh, in terms of the data infrastructure that india has created and is funding and an example of that is indian urban data exchange that has been put together funded by the government of india omidyar network is also a supporter uh incubated at indian institute of science trying to make sure that there is interoperability for data which is useful for smart cities can we use some of that infrastructure to test some of these recommendations which are very broad uh across sectors and therefore make it more specific to can we pick up mobility data and see how some of these recommendations on creating a data trustee making sure there is value that is being created and uh, ensuring that the rules and regulations the accountability framework is uh, being set uh, and and lastly being able to make sure that we can conduct a cost benefit analysis as well there is value can we demonstrate that value and in 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 a more evidence based in a more empirical manner uh, and therefore we can then steal a march or we can then 
uh, credentialize the discourse that we are having here uh, in more evidence and there, therefore be uh, in a position to shape the norms and the discussions coming in from the EU. Increasingly, it will be from the UK as well. And there are other countries like uh, Netherlands that are in Rajit uh, called out. US, of course, is, uh, is, is way behind or lagging in terms of these, this thinking. So I'll just sum it up by saying that, you know, India has been in other sectors being more of either a taker of global norms or an objector, like always objecting to uh, what, what they do not uh, uh, agree with. And this is an opportunity to shape some of these norms and, and, and that's incredible. And uh, this is the right time to ask questions about where does value get created from data in the value chain and how can uh, countries such as India be, uh, have the equitable share of that value uh, by shaping some of these norms. So I'll, I'll, I'll close there and uh, pass it back to you. Uh, thank you so much, Ashant, uh, for that sort of excellent overview. I think uh, I'm going to spend maybe about uh, two, three minutes just responding to some of the sort of high level points that uh, Arindrajit had made, mostly like expanding, I think, on some of them. Uh, and then uh, I was thinking we could give Arindrajit maybe three minutes to respond to like cumulatively everything that he's heard from us so far. And then we could like do a round of uh, Q&A. Uh, the first point that I'd largely like to sort of make, uh, because Arindri definitely touched upon it, but it's something that I thought that we could go into a little bit in detail, is just how serious India is really about sort of like wanting to play all of this out in the international and global arena, right? So uh, to give you all an example, uh, when uh, Arindri mentioned that at the WTO, there's a group of developed countries that have now decided to create a sub-working group and have started looking at e-commerce more specifically, on that day that that committee had its first meeting, India had a separate meeting in New Delhi where it called the group of 77 countries who it often sort of leads uh, as a trade bloc member and had a separate meeting here in India where they in like deep detail discussed like pretty much the exact opposite of what those developed countries were discussing at, in Geneva on that same day, right? And uh, what I think this really showcases is the level of sort of not just strategic planning and interest, but the seriousness with which India is deciding to engage on this issue, not necessarily uh, from, from the perspective of like norm creation, as, as Basu mentioned, because it's obviously doing that, but also from a sense of like geopolitical posturing. Like India definitely sees itself as being an entity that can be at the, like, the tip of the spear of a group of a large number of countries and push for a form and a way of data regulation that um, like honestly, I don't think the world has really seen in the past because of how heavily influence has been with the European Union. Uh, and I think that that uh, is of particular importance because that makes all the points that Arindrajit had raised about uh, the importance of civil liberties, the broader idea of being placed in the constitutional democracy, all the more important because um, in the international arena, I mean, if you talk to diplomats, if you like speak to people who have engaged in the field for quite some time, India has quite an enviable reputation, right? It's known as a country that more often than not is great at diplomacy and stands for the right things, but is very good at prioritizing sovereign and national interests. I mean, the, just the examples that Basu gave around climate change, around nuclear sort of energy and um, like you know, nuclear weapons are all fantastic examples, um, the law of the sea and the unclause of where India managed to play a very big role in not only helping developing countries all over the world in achieving a particular outcome, but doing so in a manner without necessarily like sacrificing its sovereign interest. And things that we now presume for granted as a part of sovereign interest are things that countries like India fought for in the international arena and are now a part of like, you know, international law and international relations. So. I think, if anything, this is all the more a reason for us to push towards an idea, uh, like an ideal where we are asking for India to be, like we ask like within India as Indians, but also otherwise for India to engage in an iterative process of making sure that the position that it actually advocates for in these fora is as representative of its reputation as a democracy all over the world. And I completely agree with Ashant in that like we've definitely seen that happen. And we've seen India's like literal experience in dealing with technology regulation improve on a month to month, not even year to year basis, uh, with given how conversations have gone over uh, the past couple of years, but it's definitely something that we should do a fair bit. Right. And the second uh, uh, point that I would like to make is like, I think it's also a very interesting case where uh, India is also starting to realize that like the positions that it takes internationally and in geopolitical negotiations don't necessarily have to completely align with current domestic positions, A, but B, it, they can also be make or break decisions, right? And I would like to use the example of RCEP, which is this uh, internet, this like regional trade agreement that was signed in um, the Asia-Pacific region uh, last year, and India decided to not become a part 
of the RCEP, which is called the Regional uh, Economic Comprehensive Partnership, uh, for various reasons. But one of the key reasons was because there were provisions that prevented national mandates for uh, data localization uh, in the agreement, uh, which many, like, I mean, and it's like, it's not, not a point that I think many, I've heard many people discuss so far, but China was the key like instigator of the RCEP agreement, right? And you have a country like China that pushed for a trade agreement th and thanks to like Australia and New Zealand being members contains the provision that says that if possible, you should avoid having data localization measures as a part of your national legislation. So why is China doing that, right? And I think that like the reason China is doing that is even because countries like China understand the geopolitics of being a part of a more global interconnected economy and not saying that just because we have a law that says you have to localize your, we will, we will only advocate for that position when we are creating this international agreement, right? And I think that that level of strategic awareness um, and give and take is something that like India can not just learn from, but also should like serve as a counterfoil to like an, Taking again the first point that I said, like I think the ideals that India stands for when it comes to like its constitution, fundamental rights, being a democracy, and broadly having a functional sort of governance framework in a way that very few countries, I would say, uh, in the Asia Pacific region can came to claim to have the tradition of, uh, it is something that we should leverage much more actively to push for a vision of data governance that is uh, like not just interoperable, but allows countries like India and other developing countries to stake their claim on the international arena, but to do so in a manner that is interoperable and that does let the rest of the world convene around certain points and, and achieve, like I think, things that even just a couple of years ago, nobody would have really thought um, uh, countries like ours would be able to achieve on the international arena when it comes to technology regulation. And, and I think that that's a great thing, right? So those are the two broader sort of high level points that I wanted to make. Basu, over to you for like maybe like three minutes of, of responses. And I, I'm aware that we probably have about like five to 10 minutes left for the discussion. So I also want to be able to make sure that like uh, um, if Sushant and uh, Tarunima have responses to you, they can cover those as well. Awesome, awesome. Thanks. So I'll, I I agree with uh, pretty much everything that was said after, after I spoke. And thank you, Udhav, for uh, summarizing in great detail uh, a number of important developments that I wasn't uh, able to to get to. So thanks, thanks a lot. Um, I'm going to limit it to three points, and and largely again be extensions of what has already been said. So initially, uh, Tarunima spoke a fair bit about interdependence, and I think this speaks to um, again understanding global governance today. There is there is a theory put out by two scholars, Farrell and Newman, called weaponized interdependence. And that sounds like a very cool term, but that is the reality we are in, we are in today. It sounds very, you know, heavy, like weaponized interdependence. But it is, it is a reality of where we are today, right? Where essentially, if you regulate in a certain way, in a manner that harms a country, it is because of the interdependence of supply chains, it is very possible for that country to hit back through uh, retaliatory measures. Through as long as they are justified as per trade law in, in some way. And very often this interdependence doesn't actually play out in a manner that can be challenged the WTO. A lot of these things don't actually even go to the WTO because of, of various reasons, because countries are, uh, I mean, don't want to litigate essentially or bear the costs of litigation. So often interdependence plays out politically, right? Where if you ban a TikTok, then China will come back at you by doing something that hurt, that hits you where it hurts. So there are vulnerabilities that each country has. And essentially what, I mean, every country is trying to figure out is what the adversary's points of weakness are. And that is what weaponized interdependence essentially is. So I, I really, I mean, I, I really like the way Tarunima put it. Another point that she made that's been discussed, uh, there's a great set of papers by Internet Democracy Project on it is whose sovereignty are we protecting? When we say digital sovereignty, often you have a situation where it is the, I mean, and more abstract notion of national sovereignty that's protected at often at the cost of individuals. So really there is a need to center the individual again and that speaks to the values point that, that Udhav was making at the end. So Shant, uh, as always fully agree with, uh, with um, uh, pretty much all his all his points just i mean I, I don't i don't want to go too much into the weeds on this but in terms of the netherlands regulation i was speaking about actually has more of a responsive regulatory approach than the present version of the npd where they essentially start off with voluntary sharing and then they have mechanisms for uh, mandatory sharing if that voluntary sharing doesn't work out but i do agree that the ethos is to actually move away towards from mandatory sharing to data altruism and i think that's that's a good thing and i mean the, the last thing that sushant said i can't i mean he said it really well so I'm, i i don't want to go into that but the fact that we are still at a very early stage of this discussion and we, i mean 
we, there is there is a long time to go. We were having uh, we were trying to hedge bets on how long it will take for this to become enforceable regulation. I said at least a year. Sushant had said uh, maybe m much more than that. So um, we. Uh, yeah, so I, I think we are in very early stages, but yeah. but therefore there's I a need. Five. To... Sorry, five I, years. Yeah, I, I said, said five. five. Five years. Yeah, exactly. So so long, long time, uh, long time left. Uh, so yeah. So I mean, so let's let's try and be as responsive rather than assertive as possible. The final point, and this ties in what both Udbhav and Sushant said at the end, which was that India has been a taker, and this is actually, I mean, this is may not interest people who are not, uh, I mean, interested in the history of foreign policy, but I think this is relevant for this discussion, is that um, India has been a taker and not a shaper of previous rules. And Udbhav then said that, but India has been very active on this particular question. So uh, a person I've had the privilege of working with a little bit as well, Kartik Nachiappan, based at NUS, he's written an excellent book called Does India Negotiate, where he actually looks at the history of India's negotiation in four uh, four regimes. Um, if you buy that book, it's it's a uh, little high, high, highly priced, but I mean, it's very, very much worth the, worth the expenses. Um, so uh, it looks at four different regimes, and it says that India's negotiation and the extent to which it negotiates, how well it negotiates, what it says is dependent on three criteria. And I'm going to try and apply these three criteria broadly to data governance. One is strategic interests. Is this a foreign policy priority for India or not? Udbhav has already told you why it is, right? There is clearly, and Sushant as well, right? That, that there is value that India can gain from this, that various uh, uh, Stakeholders within India can gain from this. India wants to be a rule shaper. It wanted to be a rule shaper on tobacco control because of the, for example, on tobacco control, because of the harms that a lack of tobacco control was actually causing to uh, just Indian people and the number of deaths from it, right? So therefore, India was very assertive on that front. Um, India has not been assertive, even in, in other cyber regimes, they've not been so assertive on the, uh, at the UN first committee, the UN disarmament committee on regulating cyber weapons and cyber security and things like that. It is because for whatever reason, they don't see that as an immediate strategic priority. Digital economy, they definitely do. And, and I think that's a fair approach to take. Second is institutions. I already spoke about this, but are government institutions aligned? Are they are the right institutions working with the negotiators, the MEA and the Ministry of Commerce at the G20? Are they working with them to shape rules in a manner that benefits everyone? Mubhav already gave an ex example of how when there was one meeting going on in Geneva, sort of uh, India put got together another meeting in, in Delhi, goes to show how institutions are aligned. And the final point is, Again, meetings like this about stakeholders. What are the different stakeholders in this ecosystem? Of course, domestic industry is a huge one and they have shaped India's approach to WTO previously as well. But there are several other players like civil society organizations, um, foreign industry, and therefore the extent to which India shapes and whether it chooses to be a passive viewer or a person to persistent objector is dependent on these three criteria, which uh, I mean is reflective despite of its relatively small size, our relatively mature uh, foreign policy establishment We're using the maturity in, in the context of tech policy. What I think having looked at how the MEA has engaged in, in regime shaping over the past 20, 30 years, and even how it's engaging now, um, it, it does reflect a certain sense of uh, maturity and, and, and leadership, which I think is a good thing. The question really is, do we have the domestic regulation to back up that, that maturity? And I think, uh, I mean, all the suggestions that came from Sushant, Arunima, and Udbhav, I think, are great to ensure we improve our domestic approach so that we are able to shape it in an appropriate manner. Thanks, Udbhav, and thanks, everyone. Thanks, Aranjit. Uh, so now, very quickly, like, Tanuma, like a minute to two, do you have any concluding sort of remarks? We have a live question for Basu that I'll ask just when we're done, but I'll quickly give you and Sushant two, two minutes each. Uh, well, good. I, I think uh, learned a lot from what all the uh, panelists and uh, and Rajit's presentation. I, I do hope that uh, Sushant's estimate is closer to what's going to happen than Anandrajit's estimate. And I do hope that, that that the motivation is of this document is a statement of intent. I think uh, there is a lot of iterations and work that needs to be done. So I'm, I'm going to pause with that. Yeah, very quickly, Udbhav. Um, I think the point about uh, India being a shaper of some of these norms, I think there is demand as well. So I've been part of some World Economic Forum conversations, which brings together uh, private players, private sector players, and civil society. Uh, delegates from Africa typically have made this point that at least in the old order, where there was raw material, 
which went to get finished and then we bought the finished product at least we get paid for it's very simplistic but bear with me at least we get paid for the raw material in this today's data economy uh, we are just uh, the data is being extracted out and you know uh, there, there are no taxes and uh, the value accrues elsewhere and uh, uh, in in that context shaping of the norms as to what is okay in this globalized open internet in terms of data governance would be very very critical and uh, challenging the norms takes a lot a lot of scholarship it takes a lot of uh, confidence on the global scale as well and some of this discourse will lead us towards that thanks uh, shant so but like we had a question from uh, Pitu Bandopadhyay from Katz as well, saying, uh, hi, you spoke about the fact that India is not violating any international agreements. However, it has been observed in recent times that international agreements are being tied with data norms, most commonly about data localization. Non-personal data norms could be next. At the same time, the government of India is touting for more foreign investments in the country. Do you think that the NPD regulation in its current form is likely to contradict India's foreign trade policy, where India is staunchly pushing for the idea that it's an open and innovative ecosystem for new businesses. Yeah, hi, 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 Situ. Hope, hope you're well. Um, uh, so, uh, it could. Um, so, first of all, yeah. I mean, just to reiterate, there isn't actually an existing. There is. I mean, there is possibly something on trips, the the intellectual property agreement under the WTO that this report may uh, violate the database agreement but it's 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 debatable I, I don't think it'll it'll go to litigation but apart from that there is no existing international law that it violates right so um on india's foreign trade and i was actually doing this as well that data localization and this kind of data sharing mandate are need to be looked at slightly separately even though it's uh, part of the same narrative and part of the same so sovereignty ecosystem they need to be looked at separately why one because the, the uh, trade agreements that exist you look at the regional comprehensive economic partnership you look at the trans pacific partnership you look at the us mexico trade agreement all the regional trade agreements that exist right now they do have uh, clear obligations on data localization and clear exceptions as well, right? But on this sort of a data sharing uh, approach, there isn't actually any clear obligation built into the regional uh, trade agreement. So when we look at localization and the violation of possible uh, future trade uh, laws that may exist, we are possibly looking at something more, more immediate and, and direct because of the way in which regional trade agreements are actually mentioning this fairly explicitly. With regard to domestic regulatory control, which essentially is what data sharing uh, of this nature is, um, I think we are less likely to be violating existing global rules and much more likely to be actually just making it difficult for companies to operate in in india it is going to make it difficult maybe for uh, indian uh, companies to uh, operate in uh, in other parts of the world if there is sort of uh, this informal kind of retaliation and of course what i my, my point is not that the report in its entirety is a bad thing but if you have regulatory uncertainty and my basic issue is with that uh, sovereign purpose and and the the regulatory uncertainty around hvds and and public good um, then it's possible that the kind of compliance issues that are being generated might make it difficult for companies to exist. So I don't think, again, it doesn't violate any existing laws. It is unlikely to violate any laws that will come up in the near future, but it might just make compliance more difficult. And that's something that should be should be looked at. And that also includes the data storage point that I had, that I had made, made earlier. So that I think is, is, is my response. Not violating any laws, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's all all question. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Arindajit, for answering that question. And I think uh, that's it for the sort of questions. I've noticed that we have none, none on YouTube either. But uh, if there are any other questions, uh, you can see that uh, Nadika has shared within the Zoom um, sort of chat a link to the Privacy Mode website where you can leave your questions and we can sort of answer them asynchronously offline as well. So please feel free to do that. Uh, and we're already about a minute over time. So I'm uh, going to like Thank everyone for spending uh, like 
the past hour with us and listening to like what was a very enlightening and fascinating conversation and uh, hand it over to Narika to sort of uh, summarize it. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Subhav. Thank you, Arundhati. Thank you, Sushant Tarunima, for joining us. And thank you for all the questions and responses. Uh, I just noticed there's one more question by Aman. I think maybe we can take this. Uh, uh, I, I think we can go for a couple of more minutes and then we can wrap up. Or uh, do you want to answer this offline? Uh, I mean, I'm happy. Like, it seems like a pretty interesting question. So um, I think we can give let's, it a shot. Yeah, let's just do, let's just do it live. Thanks, Aman. Sure. So the question is, in Indira Gandhi's tenure, we saw bank nationalization, and now in the present regime, we are seeing data nationalization. Is Section 91 to uh, asserting that the government can acquire data in the name of eminent domain? Uh, effectively, in this way, is the government going around the right to fund, uh, right to privacy judgment? And also, is the non-personal data framework a death nail to intellectual death nail uh, to intellectual property rights? Um, any volunteers who want to take this question? Uh, so Sushant, anyone? So Sushant, do you want to uh, do you want to take this or? Yeah, I mean, I'll I'll give a quick perspective, but the details of it, Arunjit, I'll hand it to you, hand it back to you. So I think uh, it has in the the point about the non-personal data bill actually bringing it up and then sidestepping the question, bringing up data so uh, data for sovereign purposes and then sidestepping it by saying that it's uh, the purview of personal data protection bill. Uh, I would again uh, wear the hat of an optimist and say that since uh, it's being examined threadbare, uh, the personal data protection bill, and, and, and it is outside the purview of the non-personal data protection bill, I'm hopeful for an outcome that is, pro that is uh, protective of civil liberties and respectful of the judgment. It cannot go beyond uh, uh, what has been set as uh, the requirement of proportionality of, of uh, uh, the other checks that Supreme Court has put in place. So while I, I, I feel the, uh, the, the need for discussing it uh, in further detail as to you know, the merits of it and where should the line be drawn, because it seems like it's giving a carte blanche to the government for acquiring data for uh, sovereign purposes, for pandemic response and whatnot. Uh, however, I think uh, over the period of discourse, discussions, consultations, it would uh, evolve into something far more acceptable uh, and, and respectful of civil liberties. And within the personal data protection bill, I think it is outside the purview as it should be of the non-personal data protection uh, report. Thanks, Shantanima. Yeah, okay, so, so the pay... The report is going to great ends to say that it's not a death knell to uh, IPR, right? Uh, and uh, I think it's also too premature to have that discussion because we don't know how it's going to play out uh, on ground, right? So, so one example that comes to my mind is, um, you know, when the when financial regulation asserted that credit bureaus should uh, share credit reports with their cu customers, right? Like with their customers, because it's a it's like a right to information for them to know how they're doing in terms of their financial health. What no one expected and what ended up happening was that uh, selling credit reports became like a profitable market, right? Like, so basically you now have, you know, bank, banks or you have, sorry, you have credit bureaus basically that will sell you. And I don't know if you guys are on po policy bill or any of these things they will consistently send you, send, uh, send you messages saying, uh, do you want to access your credit report, right? So, so I think uh, I trust that the industry is smarter than um, than you know than we what we uh, uh, are making out from this bill. And so, if this was to play out, I expect that uh, they would be creative enough to make sure that their IPR or at least their economic interests are protected. Wonderful, thank you, Rindaji. Yeah, I'll, I'll be very, very quick. I think uh, in terms of Section ninety one of the personal data protection bill, which I think is what is closest to eminent domain. I think, yes, it is definitely the state exercising powers of, of eminent domain over um, the, the difference is that in, in the case of banks, you could say that fine. I mean, it is owned by the community of Indian citizens who are, and therefore the banks are operating for the benefit of, of a community. What is actually more dangerous with this kind of eminent domain is that it's, probably much closer to the kind of eminent domain that's exercised when land is taken away to build like whatever 
dams and projects and stuff right where i mean even though it's not a pr- proprietary relationship it's actually something that's much closer to the person it is i mean data as as person is also a, a interpretation that we know well right so it is eminent domain for sure you are absolutely right i would i mean second you and further extend your point and say that it is a slightly more dangerous kind of eminent domain if it's mandated but that in that sense the the report the report so section 91 of the pdp bill is is i i think hopefully will will get changed but i think in that sense the report as sushant mentioned earlier as well is trying to reduce that uh, interventionist encroaching approach and make it much more altruistic and uh, along the lines of the data governance act so in that sense the report tries to uh, mitigate it a little bit so 